Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day 35 in our 90-day SAT prep series. Today I'll be taking you through about 20 minutes in the SAT math section and then about 25 to 30 minutes in the SAT reading section. Uh, so I'm a 1590 SAT scorer myself. I've scored perfectly on the math section on back-to-back -back occasions and I've scored uh, 1590 overall on one SAT uh, as well as 1580 on another. Okay, so I've scored perfectly on the writing section back-to-back, -back, perfectly on the math section back-to-back. Uh, and let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to do today. So today we're going to be spending uh, about 20 minutes going through problems 31 through 38 of a 2018 released SAT from the state of Maine. Uh, as I go through that, I'll be giving you my tips, tricks, advice, and strategies for the SAT math section, particularly in this case for the with calculator section uh, where you don't have multiple choice, where you have to fill in the blank. Um, and then after that, we'll switch over to the SAT reading section where I'm going to give you my tips, tricks, advice, and strategies over there for how you can be efficient with the SAT reading section and become better at that. Uh, so with that, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Check out our channel for other videos. And let's go ahead and get started with question 31. All right, so we got 31. If 2x plus 3 equals 5 and 3y minus 3 equals 6, what is one possible value of x times y or the absolute value of x times y? So keep in mind, it's the absolute value. Uh, and it has to be because you can't put a negative in on the SAT fill in the blank math section as of January of 2021. You cannot put in a negative sign anyway, so it would have to be absolute value. Um, so let's go ahead and solve this, right? So we have absolute value 2x plus 3 equals 5. I'd subtract 3 from each side, get rid of that. 5 minus 3, uh, 5 minus 3 is going to leave me with 2. So now I have 2x equals 2. I could go ahead and say that x is 1 then, right? So x will be 1. We'll call x 1. Next, we got 3y minus 3 equals 6. Let's just go ahead and add 3 to each side, add 3 to each side. We get 9 equals 3y, divide each side by 3, we get that y is going to equal 3 then. Okay, so uh, 1 will be x, y will be 3, 3 times 1, answer there is going to be 3. Okay, that's absolute value, but it was going to be positive anyways. Uh, so our answer there is going to be 3. So that one, obviously, fairly easy question in my opinion, right? Not too bad at all, not too difficult. Uh, there's a reason for that, that's because problems 31 through 38 on the SAT uh, math with calculator section are designed to get progressively more difficult as you go through them, right? So 31, it's going to be more similar to what you'd see on like a 1 through a 5 of the with calculator section of multiple choice. All right, so now let's go ahead and get into 32. So I've got a graph of revenue. I've got year on my x-axis, and I've got revenue in millions of dollars on my y-axis. So the scatter plot is showing me the revenue in millions of dollars a company earned over several years in a line of best fit for the data. In year four, the difference between actual revenue and the predicted revenue is n million dollars, where n is a positive integer. What is the value of n? Round your answer to the nearest whole number. Disregard the dollar sign when gritting your answer. Okay, so we're looking at year four, looking at the difference between our line of best fit and our actual revenue. Okay, we see our actual revenue is about 55, uh, and that's in millions of dollars, obviously. And we see our predicted is going to be 50. Okay, so what's the difference between those two? Well, that's going to be $5 million. Now, we're already told n is in millions of dollars, so our answer then it will just be 5. Okay, so that one right there, also pretty simple. Uh, one recommendation I have that you can put in your notes is notice how I drew lines on my graph. That's something I recommend that you do when you take the SAT math section because it'll avoid you making a simple mistake, right? A lot of people, if they just look over, uh, some people can get it right, but some people, they may look over from this 55 and they may look at it and say, oh, that's 50, but it was really 55, right? And they may look over from, uh, they probably wouldn't mess it up when there's a line right there, but right here with this dot, right? They might look over and say, um, oh, that's 60, right? They might accidentally glance up or something. So that's why I recommend drawing those lines on your graph is to avoid making those mistakes, right? Another thing we want to pay attention to is our scale here, right? So that's a 50 and a 60. We're in between them, so we're at 55. Always pay attention to that. We don't want to mess that up either. All right, so overall, 32, not too difficult of a problem. Now we got 33. So we're told the figure above is the floor plan drawn by an architect for a small concert hall. The stage has a depth 8 meters, which I see is also already shown. Uh, two walls each have a length of 10, also already shown. If the seating portion of the hall has an area of 180 square meters, okay, it said seating portion, I see that that's right here, so that's going to have to be 180 meters squared, what is the value of x? Okay, so here's why we need this 10 and this 8 here, because we have to solve uh, for what this is going to be right here, okay, where this arrow is pointing in order to solve this problem. So if we have 10 here, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for what this is right here, and we're going to call this right here, we'll call it y, okay, so we want to solve for y. So we see that we're going to have a 10 meter as our hypotenuse. So we take our hypotenuse, we square it, and we subtract our other side length. Our other side length is eight. So we take 10 squared, we subtract eight squared, and we know that that's gonna leave us with six squared. So how did I know that so quickly? Well, this is one of those triangles that it can be helpful to memorize, okay? If you have 10 squared, that's 100. Eight squared is 64. 
which gives you 36. Okay. You take the square root of that to solve for what the other side length is, and you get 6. So what this is called is a 10-8-6 triangle. In my opinion, it's one that it can be helpful to remember for the SAT. So if you just want to put that in your notes, I would recommend doing it because, in my opinion, um, it's just something that if you know, it'll save you time. And anything that can save us time with the SAT math section is something I'm all about and all for. So that is definitely something that I would put in your notes. So um, pretty much as soon as I saw a 10 and an 8 here, I wouldn't have even done this step any of these steps over here, I would have immediately known that it's a six, and that's how it's gonna save you time. But if you didn't immediately know it was six, that's how you solve for it. You do 10 squared minus eight squared, uh, that's gonna give you six squared. So answer there, six is gonna be what Y is. Now keep in mind, we need to solve for what this right here is. And I just switched from that, so we got this right here, right? We need to solve for what that whole length is all the way across. And I'm gonna redraw that line because it was very, very bad. Okay, we're talking about this right here, all of this, that whole line. Okay, so six is just from this right here where that line is over to right here. So we got to double that to get 12 and that's going to be uh, what all of that is, right? From there to there. So now we got to solve for X, right? We know that our area is going to be X times 12. So 12 X then is going to equal 180. We obviously divide each side by 12 to solve for X, 180 over 12. We can plug that into our calculator. That way we're making sure that we get our correct answer, 180 over 12 and we get 15. Okay, so 15 will be our answer there. That's 15, one five. All right, so why did I say plug into my calculator rather than use mental math? Well, 180 over 12, right? We're dealing with a digit that is three digits, right? Anytime that we have a three digit number on the math with calculator section and we're doing the free response section, I recommend using your calculator and plugging it in. Okay, on the multiple choice, sometimes it's okay to use mental math because using your calculator will slow you down and there's 30 multiple choice questions. So if you're constantly using your calculator, it could slow you down. Um, so up there, it's, it's okay to use mental math to save time, especially because you have an A, a B and a C and a D, right? And if you're off by one or two, most of the time, uh, one of the answer, other answer choices won't be off by one or two. They'll be off by more than that because they'll be expecting you to make a mistake rather than a silly mistake dividing like 180 over 12. So a lot of times you'll be able to catch yourself up there, uh, but down here, there's nothing to catch you because there's no options. Okay, so there's nothing to catch you if you make a mental error because there's no choices. So that's why I recommend with the math with calculator for your response section to go ahead and use the calculator for something like this. Okay, now notice I didn't use it up here, uh, right? Because I immediately recognized it was a 1086. Uh, I'm not gonna waste time checking that because I know that from memory, I have it memorized. Uh, but down here, right, if we're dealing with a three digit number and it's not super simple, uh, then I would go ahead and use a calculator. Now, like I said, three digit number, right? Over here, I'm not gonna use a calculator for nine over three. I need to know that that's three, okay? Otherwise, that's gonna take me forever if I gotta do all of these simple steps using a calculator. So I'm not saying do that. What I'm saying is if you have a three digit number, right? So it's something that's in the hundreds or the thousands, then I'm saying it probably makes sense to use your calculator on that last sort of step, right? Just to make sure you're getting the right answer and not making a mistake. So my general rule of thumb would just be um, if you're using something on the math with calculator section, you're on free response and you're dealing with a digit that's no more than three digits, right? A number that's uh, in the hundreds or more, I would just recommend using your calculator just to be sure. All right, now we got question 34. So Jacob bought two types of pens. He has blue pens that cost $0.6 each and red pens that cost D times as much as the blue pen. Uh, if the cost of three blue pens and six red pens is 1080, what is the value of D? Okay, so we got equal 10.8. We know that we have 0 0.6 times each blue pen. We have three blue pens, so 0 0.6 times three. Then we have plus 0 0.6 times, um, we know that we have six red pens, so six times 0 0.6. I'm gonna move my plus over here, plus six times 0 0.6 times however many uh, times each blue pen costs for a red pen, right? So times D, okay? Because D is however many times as much a red pen is as a blue pen. Okay, so now we just go ahead and solve here. So we got 0 0.6 times three, that's 1.8. So I subtract 1.8 from each side. That's gonna give me nine. So now I have nine equals six times 0 0.6 times D. Six times 0 0.6 is gonna give me 3.6, I believe. Uh, I'll just quick check that with my calculator because I can, because this is after all that section. So six times uh, 0 0.6, six times 0 0.6, that's gonna give me 3.6. So I'm gonna divide each side by 3.6, right? Divide each side by 3.6 to get rid of that. All right, so now we got nine over 3.6, that's gonna give us D. Plug that in our calculator and let's see what we get. We're gonna get two and a half. 
Okay, so answer there will be two and a half for D. Okay, so that one right there, uh, that one's not too bad in my opinion either. Okay, so two and a half will be our answer for 34. All right, so as far as things you should put in your notes here, okay? This one right here, we got 0 0.6 times each blue pen. We knew that each blue pen, there were three of them, so we plugged that in. Then after that, it was just making sure that we're solving for D, right? So setting up our equation right. Once again, 34, not too difficult, okay? These early ones in the free response section aren't meant to be too difficult. They're meant to be fairly, fairly simple. So we got George took a nonstop flight to Dallas, or from Dallas to Los Angeles, a total flight distance of 1,233 miles. The plane flew at a speed of 460 miles per hour for the first 75 minutes of the flight and at a speed of 439 miles per hour. All right, I can't tell if my screen is the only one that messes up or yours, uh, but either way, uh, we have at a speed of 439 miles per hour for the remainder of the flight. I'm gonna zoom out because my screen isn't working. I'm not sure if it shows up on the recording or not, um, but it does on mine. All right, so we've got planes flying at a speed 460 miles per hour for 75 minutes of the flight and at a speed of 439 miles per hour for the remainder of the flight to the nearest minute, how many minutes did the plane fly at 439 miles an hour? All right, we're going to take our total miles, which is 1233, and we're going to set it equal to our miles traveled. We know that we've traveled at 460 miles per hour, so miles per hour, uh, for 75 minutes. We know 75 minutes, that is 1.25 hours, right? That's one and a quarter hours. Okay, so that's going to be 1.25 H, okay? So we've got that, and then we've got that much plus that 439 miles per hour that we're traveling times however many hours it takes us, so times H. And now keep in mind, we got to answer in minutes. Okay, that's important. We're answering in minutes, not hours. So we have to solve the number of hours and then convert it to minutes. Okay, so to do that, we're going to do this 1233. We're going to subtract that 460 times 1.25. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, we see that our hours are going to cancel. We'll be left with miles. So that's good because we have miles over here. So we go ahead and do that. We subtract 460 times 1.25 from our other side. Plug that in our calculator real quick. So we got 1233 minus 460 times 1.25 and that's going to give us 658 658 right i'm just going to put an arrow from this over here because we're subtracting it from this side too um, so we do that from both sides that leaves us with 658 is equal to that 439 miles per hour times our number of hours so at this point we divide each side by that 439 divide by 439 to get our number of hours divide by 439 Okay, and we get that our number of hours, when we plug this into our calculator, 439 is going to give us 1.4988, okay? Now, we know that that's basically 1.5, right? We know that we would round this over, and we're going to get one and a half hours, okay? So now we do one and a half hours times 60 minutes, 60 minutes per hour. We see our hours are going to cancel, right? And we'll be left with minutes. So one and a half times 60, we know will give us 90 minutes. So our answer there will be 90. All right, so for this one, what's the big thing here? Well, the big thing here is paying attention to the fact that we have to answer in minutes, okay? I bet the reason that this one's 35 and not earlier up is because a lot of people are going to answer in hours, okay? But we have to answer in minutes. So it's paying attention to details like that, always important. I talk a lot about how important it is to pay attention to your last sentence in your um, question because your last sentence always pretty much contains what you have to answer with, right? And the units and things like that. So it's very, very important to pay close attention to that last sentence, okay? In this case, it's answering in minutes. All right, so 35, answer there is going to be 90. Other than that, it was just solving for, pretty much solving for um, a variable, one variable, so not too difficult as far as mathematically goes. 36, we've got an arc of a circle measures 2.4 radians. To the nearest degree, what's the measure in degrees of this arc? Okay, this one right here, simply converting from radians to degrees. So if you remember back when I taught in week one about the equation for this, we take our 2.4 radians and we multiply by the fact that we have 180 degrees per our one, or our per pi radians, per pi radians. Okay, so we're going to take that, we're going to plug in our calculator then, 2.4 over pi, 2.4 divided by pi, then we're going to multiply by 180. So then we multiply by 180, and we see that we're asked to round uh, to the nearest degree, okay? So when I plug that in my calculator, I get 137.509, okay? So if I'm rounding to the nearest degree, that means I round up to 138, right? So I'm going to round up to 138. So 138 would be my answer there. Now, in the question and answer service for this test, 
it says that they would also accept 137. Now, the reason, in my opinion, that it says that is because if you had someone who was not taking this with a calculator, because you can choose not to, now you should never choose not to take it with a calculator. You should always choose to take it with a calculator because you can. Um, but if you were to choose not to and you didn't have all these digits of pi memorized, my guess is that you would end up rounding to three point or one, 137. So I'm guessing that's why that's also an accepted answer. But we're going to want to use our calculator and we're going to want to use the exact answer for pi from our calculator. So we're going to get 138 there. Okay, because I don't want I don't want you guys counting on them doing that for the next SAT, uh, whenever it is counting on them having that variance of it also accepting 137. Because if we're using our calculator, the correct answer is without a doubt 138. Okay, so don't count on them doing that for every SAT. Okay, so always use the exact number pi from your calculator. So answer for 36 is going to be 138. All right, so now we've got two questions left. As you can see, 31 through 36, not too difficult questions at all. Okay, questions 37 and 38 are referring to the following information. So I see I've got a box here, it looks like. We've got a packaging engineer is designing a container holding 12 drinking glasses shaped as regular octagonal prisms. Her initial sketch of the top view of the base of the container is shown above. If the length and the width of the base and the initial sketch were doubled, at most, how many more glasses could the new container hold? Okay, what would be a mistake here would be doubling the number of containers it holds now. Okay, that's the mistake that they want you to make. Don't make that mistake. What we have to do is we have to take this 12 here, we double it, and we know 12 times 2 gives us 24. We take this 9 here, we multiply it by 2, that gives us 18. So our new dimensions are going to be 24 by 18. Okay, so our new area then is going to be 24 times 18. That's going to give us our new area. Okay, our old area, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter here as far as I can tell, because what I see immediately is I see that I have um, a distance from here to here, right? And I know it has to be the same from here to here anyways, but we know that anyways, because we have nine here over three of these stacked ones, right? Nine over three. That means that I'm going to have three inches is what that distance vertically is going to be. And then I got 12 over four going across. This 12 over four of these going across, right? We got one, two, three, four. So I do 12 over four. That's also going to give me that three. Okay. So I know that's three high, uh, three going across. Okay. So the dimensions, really what I'm looking at here. Um, is technically, uh, not technically, but basically a square, that's three by three, three by three, for a nine uh, area square. So nine units of whatever it is square. So I'm going to write nine U squared. Okay, so that's my area there for each one of those drinking glasses. I'm going to need nine uh, whatever units it is squared. So what I do then is I take that 24, multiply it by 18. I'll plug, plug that into my calculator so I don't make a mental mistake because it's a very, very quick way to plug in your calculator anyways. So I go ahead and do that. 24 times 18, I get 432, 432. Now at that point, what I do is I divide by the nine. Okay, I divide by nine because this 432 is my area in units squared. Now I'm dividing by the fact that each cup takes nine units squared. My units squared will cancel and I'll be left with cups. So I'll have 432 over nine. I'm gonna plug that into my calculator and that is gonna give me 48, okay? Now, is 48 my answer? The answer is, it is not my answer. Okay, why is it not my answer? Because I'm asked how many more glasses the new container can hold versus the old one. So it can now contain 48 glasses, but I have to subtract my 40, or I'm sorry, I have 48 glasses that can hold now. I got to subtract however many it could hold before. I see that it could hold 12 before just by counting. Um, if it was too big to count, we would just do this 12 times nine and then divide by the fact that each one takes nine units, right? We, our nines would cancel, we see it holds 12 glasses. So now we take that 48 cups minus 12 cups, and we're left with 36 cups. Okay, so it can hold 36 more cups. So our answer for 37 is going to be 36. All right, so as far as things to put in your notes, once again, just look at how we're paying attention to what we're asked at the end of a question. That's very, very important, so we don't put in the wrong answer, um, especially with the fill-in-the-blank section like this, because... There's no multiple choice to save you, okay? There's no A, B, C, D where you can see, oh, I don't have an answer choice. I must have done something wrong. You got to be right on first time, which means you got to pay attention to what you're asked for at the end of the question because there's nothing to save you as far as answer choices go. So always paying attention to what we're asked at the end of that question. All right, 38, Carrie redesigned the container because the initial sketch didn't account for cushioning material between the glasses. The area of the base of the newly designed container is 25% greater than the area of the base in the initial sketch. What is the area in square inches of the base of the newly designed container? All right, well, we need to know 
the area of our base of our initial sketch. Okay, our initial, our initial sketch was 12 by 9. We see it's 12 by 9. So that means our initial area is 12 times 9. Let's go ahead and plug that into our calculator. We see that that's 108. Okay, so we have 108 square inches. Now we're asked for the area and in square inches of this newly designed container. Well, we know the newly designed container is 25% greater than the old area. Okay, its area is 25% greater. So we're going to take this 108 inches squared, and we need it to be 25% greater. So we're going to multiply by 1.25, and that'll give us our answer. Okay, so we're going to plug that in our calculator, and that'll give us 135. 135 inches squared. Obviously, we don't include inches squared when we put in our number on the bubble sheet, so our answer there is just going to be 135. All right, so hopefully that was helpful for the math uh, free response with calculator section. Um, as far as big tips here that you should put in your notes, uh, anytime you have a three-digit number or you're multiplying two large numbers like this, like 12 times 9, go ahead and use your calculator because it'll help you be certain because there are no multiple choices uh, to save you. Okay, so go ahead and make sure you're using your calculator with any three-digit three -digit numbers or multiplication with large two-digit numbers. Um, Additionally, we want to make sure that we understand the fact that it gets progressively harder from 31 to 38. I'll talk more about that later as when I talk about pacing and strategy and things like that in the later videos. Um, but just understand that, have a general idea of that at first. Um, also, another big thing is that understanding that 31 basically through 36, uh, they're going to be easier than whatever 24 through 30 are on the multiple choice in general. In general. Um, and, and in my opinion, obviously other people have their opinions, but that's my opinion. Uh, so understand that. Just for now, I just want you to understand it. Uh, I'll tell you more about how that affects the strategy and the order of the questions that we, um, the order of the questions we answer later. But for now, just recognize that, just understand it, um, and just just kind of have that in the back of your head for now. I just want you to sort of see that for now, and I'll talk more about how that impacts strategy um, in the future. So for now, let's go ahead and switch over uh, to our other section for today. All right, so for today's reading section practice, we're going to be spending about 25 minutes going through passage three from SAT practice test six. This is going to be a science question. If you're following our program, you probably did this one uh, roughly a week ago, uh, or at least practice test six roughly a week ago. Uh, as I go through here, you can pay attention to uh, questions you got wrong, how I get them right, um, uh, strategies that I use, tips, tricks, advice, everything like that. Uh, to start, obviously, I'm going to read through uh, the passage. As I go through, I'll highlight the things that I would be underlining if I was doing this in paper and pencil. Um, then after that, I'm going to go through why I highlighted those things so you can get a better idea of things you should be underlining on your read-through of the SAT uh, reading section and re reading sections in the future. Um, and then after that, I'll get into the questions. I'll try to identify question types for you so you can kind of get used to uh, identifying that and using that to help you find the right answer. Um, and then I'll get into why correct answer choices are correct, why incorrect answer choices are wrong, how I can get rid of wrong answer choices to find the correct answer, uh, and things like that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with uh, this passage. So the passage is adopted from Elsa Youngstead, Decoding a Flower's Message, copyright 2012 by Sigma Z and the Scientific Research Society. Texas gourd vines unfurl their large flared blossoms in the dim hours before sunrise. Until they close at noon, their yellow puddles and mild, Squashy aroma attracts bees that gather nectar and shuttle pollen from flower to flower. But when you advertise to pollinators, you advertise in an open communication network, says chemical ecologist Ian Baldwin of the Max Planck Institute of Chemical Ecology in Germany. You attract not just the good guys, but also attract the bad guys. For a Texas gourd plant, striped cucumber beetles are among the very bad guys. They chew up pollen and petals and defecate in the flowers and transmit the dreaded bacterial wilt disease, an infection that can reduce an entire plant to a heap of collapsed tissue in mere days. In one recent study, Nina Thies and Lynn Adler took on the specific problem of the Texas gourd, how to attract enough pollinators but not too many beetles. The Texas gourd's vine, vine's main pollinators are honeybees and specialized squash bees which respond to its floral scent. The aroma includes 10 compounds, but the most abundant and the only one that lures squash bees into traps is one, four dimethoxybenzene. Intuition suggests that more of that aroma should be more appealing to bees. We have this assumption that a really fragrant flower is going to attract a lot of a lot of pollinators, says Thies, a chemical ecologist at Elms College in Chicopee, Massachusetts. But she adds that idea hasn't really been tested. An extra scent could well call in more beetles too. And to find out, she and Adler planted 168 Texas gourd vines in an Iowa field and throughout the August flowering season made half the plants more fragrant by tucking dimethoxobenzene-treated uh, swabs deep inside their flowers. 
Each treated flower emitted about 45 times more fragrance than a normal one. The other half of the plants got swabs without fragrance. The researchers also wanted to know whether extra beetles would impose a double cost by both damaging flowers and deterring bees, which might not bother to visit and pollinate flower laden with other insects and their feces. So every half hour throughout the experiment, the team plucked all the beetles off, off of the half, or I'm sorry, the team plucked all the beetles off of half the fragrant enhanced flowers and half the controlled flowers, allowing bees to respond to the blossoms with and without interference by beetles. Finally, they pollinated by hand half of the female flowers in each of the four combinations of fragrance and beetles. Hand pollinated flowers should develop into fruits with the maximum number of seeds, providing a benchmark to see whether the fragrance related activities of bees and beetles resulted in reduced pollination. It was very labor intensive, says Thies. We would be out there at four in the morning, three in the morning to try and set up before these flowers open. As soon as they did, the team spent the next several hours walking from flower to flower, observing each for two minute intervals and writing down everything we saw. What they saw was double the normal number of beetles on fragrance enhanced blossoms. Pollinators, to their surprise, did not prefer the highly scented flowers. Squash bees were indifferent and honey bees visited enhanced flowers less, less often than normal ones. But these thinks the bees were repelled not by the fragrance itself, but by the abundance of beetles. The data showed that the more beetles on a flower, the less likely a honeybee was to visit. That added, to a less re that added up to less reproduction for fragrance enhanced flowers. Uh, gourds that developed from those blossoms weighed 9% less and had on average 20 fewer seeds than those from normal flowers. Hand pollination didn't rescue the seed set, indicating that beetles damaged flowers uh, directly regardless of whether they also repelled pollinators. Hand pollination did rescue fruit weight, a hard to interpret result that suggests a lot that a lot that lost bees visits uh, did somehow harm fruit development. The new results provide a reason that the Texas gourd plants never evolved to produce a stronger scent. If you really amp up the order, uh, you don't get more pollinators, you can, but you can really get ripped apart by your enemies, said Rob Raguso, a chemical ecologist at Cornell University who is not involved in the Texas gourd study. All right, so at this point, I'm going to go back through, tell you why I highlighted everything I highlighted. Keep in mind, you can't use a highlighter on the SAT reading section, so you'll be underlining those things. It's just difficult for me to underline with the pen that I'm using uh, with this notepad type thing. All right, so as always, uh, intro, I'm always going to make sure I'm highlighting my title, decoding a, power, a flower's message, my copyright date, unless there's a date that's written. If there's a date that's written, then I'm going to highlight that. Uh, my author, of course. Um, and then in this case, with science sections, if I'm given what science uh, uh, book or newspaper or, or, or magazine it was published in, I'm always going to highlight that as well because that can give me an idea of the subject area. In this case, uh, it doesn't really because it's just the Scientific Research Society, but in some case, in some cases, it could be something like uh, the Genomic Research Society, in which case I know I'm looking at uh, things with DNA and uh, genomes and things like that. All right, so now the next thing. Next thing that I highlighted, squashy aroma attracts bees that gather nectar and shuttle pollen from flower to flower. Okay, so this is telling me why these Texas gourd vines uh, release that aroma. So that's really answering a why question that I would have. So that's why I highlighted that. Then I go down. We have a Texas gourd plant. Striped cucumber beetles are among the very by or among the very bad guys. Okay, so that's telling me these cucumber beetles are bad for the gourd plant. Okay, so that's very important context I need to know. So this is going to be uh, important context. That star right there is going to just be used for important because I won't, don't want to write it all out. Okay, so that's important context I need to know for this experimental study. Okay, for the science sections in particular, uh, it's important to make sure you pay attention to anything that's important context. Um, for the other sections, uh, there's not necessarily a super important, um, it's not necessarily as important to pay attention to context in the other sections, but it's very, very important that you highlight the context in these, right? Obviously, you, you want to pay attention to context in the other types of passages as well, um, but highlighting it on the science section is very important, so make sure you do that. All right, so next we had how to attract enough pollinators but not too many beetles, right? That's the problem the Texas gourd plants face. Okay, so this is giving me my problem that we want to solve. Okay, anytime in the science section, I'm giving me my problem that I want to solve, I want to highlight that. Okay, for the science section, any problem that we want to solve is going to be important to the passage, so I always want to highlight it. Next, we have which respond to its floral scent. Okay, we have honeybees uh, and um, these squash bees respond to its floral scent. So that's really telling me why would it release that floral scent? Well, because the honeybees and the squash bees respond to it, and they're the pollinators. Okay, so that's answering my why, so that's why I highlighted that. Okay, next thing. Um, the extra scent is going to call in more beetles as well, okay? So this is in indicating to me that we have a negative consequence, okay? So negative consequence um, associated 
with that releasing of that scent. So that's really telling me um, something bad that could come from if we were to simply add more scent. So anytime I'm given a negative consequence like that, I'm going to want to pay attention. Same thing with positive consequences. Anytime I'm given a consequence on the science section, I want to highlight that as well. Next, we have each treated flower emitted about 45 times more fragrance than a normal one. Okay, this one right here, I highlighted it because that was staggering to me. Okay, anything that's a staggering number like that, like 45 to 1 or 100 to 1 like that, I always want to pay attention to that because that's important context. So a star, context, important context. Okay, the other half of the plants got swabs without fragrance. That's just really uh, showing them my control there. Okay, next thing I highlighted. Okay, then we had a while where we didn't have to highlight anything because we were really just talking about um, mostly experimental design there. Okay, experimental design, I'm not going to waste time highlighting because that's just, I'd have to highlight the whole thing for experimental design. And then at that point, my whole passage would practically be um, filled with highlight or in your case, underline. And I don't want to do that. I want to be very particular about what I'm underlining as I go through. Okay, we have squash bees were indifferent. Okay, so they didn't prefer um, the enhanced flowers versus the normal ones. Okay, honeybees, they visited the enhanced flowers less than the normal ones. So those ones with more scent, they visited less. Uh, we think that that's because uh, not of the fragrance itself, but because of the abundance of beetles on those enhanced flowers. Uh, and the data is showing that there were uh, more beetles uh, on the flower, uh, the less likely a honeybee is to visit it. So this right here is really providing um, a summary of what our experimental data showed. Okay, so this is pretty much summarizing our experimental data. Uh, if I ever am given a summary, I'm not always given a summary of the experimental data and what it means, but if I ever am, I'm going to want to highlight that. Okay, This right here summarizes pretty much that whole experiment in really a couple sentences. So anytime I'm given that, I want to highlight it, but we're not always given that, so you may not always be able to, but on the science section, if I can get something like that that really sums up my whole um, experiment that I talked about in all these lines before in just a couple sentences, I'm going to want to highlight that. All right, next I have that added... Uh, I don't have anything there. Down here, we've got the new results provided a reason that the Texas gourd plants never evolved to produce a stronger scent. Okay, this is really answering um, my driving question behind this whole passage. And anytime I provide an answer to my driving question, I want to make sure that I highlight that. Okay, so this is an answer to my driving question. Okay, what was our uh, reason that we started this whole thing, right? Let's think about that for a minute. Well, we started this whole thing <clears throat> because we wanted to know why these Texas gourd plants aren't doing the stronger scent to get more uh, pollinated more pollinators to come and this is us answering that right it's answering that they don't do that because then they get more beetles as well so that answered our driving question there so with that now we can go ahead and get into our uh, questions and our answers question types things like that tips tricks advice all of that with these questions so the first question that we've got is question 22 so the primary purpose of the passage is what well this is going to be a purpose big picture question okay because we're asked about what the purpose of the passages. Uh, keep in mind this is the passage as a whole, which is why I call it a purpose big picture question, because we're not asked for the purpose of a, a particular little detail, but instead asked about the purpose of the, the passage as a whole or the big picture of the passage. Okay, so what's the primary purpose of this passage? Well, what this passage is really doing is it's describing the aim, method, and the results of an experiment. Okay, we start with the aim. What was the aim of the experiment? Well, the aim of the experiment is to determine why we're not releasing more scent to gain more pollinators. Then we discuss our experimental design. That was that big section that I didn't really highlight much in. It uh, was us describing our experimental design or our experimental method. Then I highlighted again that summary of our results and that discussion of our results and how they answer that driving question. So that's really what that passage is about. If we look at A, A says discuss the assumptions and reasoning behind a theory. We aren't doing that. We actually have an experiment that we use. And this right here, A doesn't talk about that experiment, so A has to be wrong. C, presenting and analyzing conflicting data. There is no conflicting data about the phenomenon, so that's wrong as well. D, showing the innovative nature of a procedure used in the study. Uh, there was really no innovative uh, procedure, okay? And also that wasn't the big picture either, okay? So anytime we're asked for the purpose of the passage as a whole, make sure we're paying attention to the big picture. That's very, very important there. All right, so 22 is going to be B. 23, as presented in the passage, Thijs and Adler's research primarily relied on which type of evidence? All right, this one right here is a very, very interesting question to me, and here's why. There's really no um, exact box necessarily that this falls into. Uh, I would really probably say that this is an evidence question, but it's not the evidence question we typically see. Evidence questions we typically see just ask us to give uh, evidence to support a claim. Now, in this case, we're really talking about what types of evidence really their research was uh, encompassed by, right? What kind of evidence did they use to really rely on in their research? So in this case, it's kind of evidence across that whole passage. So that makes this question very, very interesting to me. Um, I would characterize this as an evidence question, obviously, um, but it really applies to the big picture of the passage as well. All right, so in this case, what are we really relying on here? Well, what we're really doing, if we think about 
how that experiment was set up is there was lots and lots of direct observation, right? We talk about how they had to wake up at three and then observe each plant for two minutes, right? They had to write down all of their observations. And if our next question is evidence, which I'm just going to check if it is, it's not, um, I don't care. I'm going to go show you the evidence anyway, just because I want you to get good at recognizing this. Um, we talk about right here, okay, in line 63. We talk about observing each plant for two minute intervals and writing down everything we saw. Okay, so that right there, and I'm going to highlight that real quick, or I'll put it in blue. It'll let me switch. I'm going to put it in blue just so you can really see that. Okay, make it clear. Right, we talk about writing down everything we saw. That's direct observation. That's what they're really relying on in this experiment. Okay, so that's the answer choice we're going to want there. Okay, we already got that. That's going to be direct observation. All right. Uh, as far as why the other ones are wrong, we're not relying on historical data because we conduct our own experiments. So that's not historical. Expert testimony, nope. We want it, we're doing an experiment. We're not doing random sampling either. Okay, random sampling would be more of statistics than experiment uh, than an experiment like this. Random sampling would also likely be more uh, with social sciences. It can occur in the science sections as well, but typically that's more uh, to do with the social sciences. All right, now we got 24. Uh, let me just check if I answered question types here. I did. Okay. Question 24, which statement about striped cucumber beetles can be most reasonably inferred from our passage? All right, well, we know that those striped cucumber beetles, uh, if we recall where I highlighted it, we really talk about how uh, they're attracted to that same compound um, in those Texas gourds as those squash bees are, right? The predator, uh, which is these beetles, are attracted to that same scent that the uh, pollinators, such as those squash bees are, okay? Now, this is an inference question because it says can be inferred, but one thing that you should keep in mind with inference questions is oftentimes they're paired with evidence. I don't know if this one is. I can quick check. Uh, this one is not, but oftentimes inference questions, you'll see them paired up with an, an evidence question after it where you have to support your inference with evidence. Um, and the reason that you see that sometimes is because any inference question like this, it has to be supported by some evidence somehow, okay? So oftentimes you'll see it paired with evidence, but even if it isn't, we can still find evidence for this, right? We know that it talks about how um, those uh, beetles in that experiment, when those enhanced flowers, those enhanced flowers that have 45 times the scent, we know that they attract more beetles, okay? We know we discussed that. So that would be our evidence there, okay? Or there's also evidence earlier on, I believe in like, I think of right around like line 30 or 40 or 20, where we talk about that as well. So there's really abundant evidence to support D there, okay? We don't talk about them feeding primarily on Texas gourd plants because that would be us diving into their diet and we don't do that. We don't talk about how they're less attractive to dimel, uh, thexobenzene than the honeybees are. We never make that statement. C, they experience only minor negative effects as a result of carrying that disease. We never discuss the effects it has on them. We just say that it carries it, so we can't say C. And that takes us through that question. So I believe I already got question type there. I did. Now we got question 25. So the author's indicating that it seems initially plausible Texas gourd plants could attract more pollinators if they what? Well, that's going to be increasing their scent, right? Uh, so that would be for 25, that's going to be answer choice uh, C, right? Increasing their floral scent, okay? And I'll go ahead and find evidence for that as well. Um, I'll go ahead and show you why A, B, and uh, D are wrong real quick though. Uh, not having aromic flowers, no, we make the claim that we want more aroma, we want more floral scent because that attracts those uh, those pollinators, those squash bees. Um, B, targeted insects other than bees. Uh, they're not targeting insects, okay? They're just attracting uh, those bees to pollinate. They're not targeting them, they're not being predators targeting them. Um, D, emitting more uh, varied fragrant compounds? No, we're not arguing for more varied fragrant compounds. We're just arguing for more of that same fragrant compound. Okay, and I, if we have evidence, let's just check if we do. Uh, we don't, but I'll go ahead and find it anyways. Uh, that's going to be right um, here. Okay, uh, let's see. We got right here, intuition. I'm going to put it in blue so you can see it more clearly. Uh, intuition suggests that more of that aroma should be more appealing to those bees, right? So more of that aroma, more of that scent should attract more of those pollinators is really the evidence that we'd have there if it were an evidence question, but it is not. But I still want to support my answer just so you guys can see what I'm looking at there. Now, keep in mind, if you remember uh, your answer, like you remember uh, that it said that, don't feel like you have to go back to the test because that, then you're just wasting time. But if you got plenty of time to kill uh, your way ahead on the section, you can go quick check it by finding that evidence. But don't feel like you have to if you have really, really, really good reading comprehension, because if you're really good with reading comprehension, that'll just slow you down. So, all right, as used in line 38, treated most nearly means what? Well, obviously, it's a words and context question because it's most nearly means. Uh, as always, Whenever we have a question like this, where we have a most nearly means question, we go to the line, come up with our own answer choice first. We got line 38, it's treated. Let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so we've got each treated flower emitted about 45 times more fragrance than a normal one. Well, we know that these treated flowers are getting um, 
these tucked dimethyl uh, benzenes treated swaps deep behind their flower. So we're really alter we're altering those flowers, okay, by putting in that more of that fragrance. Um, so I would say each uh, each treated flower or each altered flower, um, each changed flower, really altered would be the best word there. Changed would be my second choice, but really altered would be my first choice. So let's see if we have altered. If we have that, that would be my my first choice answer. I see I do have that. Um, and so B through D, there would have to be something that would indicate change for any of those to be right. And there really isn't. Restored would indicate that something uh, was failing and then it was restored back to um, full uh, full quality. And that's really not what we're talking about here. Provided doesn't indicate a change or preserved doesn't indicate a change either. A is going to be our best choice there because it's showing that change from its original state. So answer there is going to be A. All right, 27. So 27, we've got what did Thies um, and Adler do as part of their study that most directly allowed Thies to reason that bees were repelled not by the fragrance itself? Well, that's what, excuse me, what that one really is going to be about is going to be about them giving them uh, the choice between those beetle-free enhanced flowers and those beetle-free normal flowers. So that's going to be answer choice D. So why is that? Well, we talk about how they pluck off those beetles. Okay, they pluck off the beetles, and I think we have evidence for our next one. I see we do. So I can go ahead and give you the evidence uh, for that as well. But that's going to be where we talk about them plucking the beetles off of the um, plants that have that enhanced fragrance and those normal ones. Because then what that's doing is that's allowing them to reason that they're not repelled by the fragrance itself. Because then there's uh, one that has 45 times the amount of fragrance and no beetles. And they're able to tell um, if they're attracted more to those. So that's going to be our answer there. All right. As far as lines for that one, um, I can go ahead and find those real quick. I believe that that was right around 47 or so I believe right around here okay yep we're talking about where they pluck the beetles off we see that's gonna be right here I'm gonna put it in blue so you can see it more clearly so we've got so every half hour throughout the experiment the team plucked all the beetles off of half the fragrance enhanced flowers and half the control allowing bees to respond uh, to the blossoms with and without interference by beetles okay so that really allows us to determine if it's the fragrance uh, that increased fragrance that is causing um, the decrease or the change or whether it is the beetles it's themselves because by removing them then we can see how they react um, to just that enhanced fragrance without the beetles so that's 45 to 50 that's our best evidence there so that's going to be answer choice a for 28 all right now we got 29 so 28 obviously that's an evidence question uh, i'm not going to write that down just because i want to save some time here 27 that one right there basically a little detail question Okay, really experimental design is what that's de uh, delving into or diving into. Uh, it's really your understanding, um, your ability to understand experimental design um, and how that applies here. Okay, so that's really testing um, science here. Okay, so understanding that little detail, how that works um, and applies to science is really the big test there. All right, 29, the primary function of the seventh and eighth paragraphs is to what? All right, well, I see that's 65 to 84. Uh, let me get up there, 65 to 84. Okay, we know that in 65, right here, I talked about that being a summary of our results. Okay, as I go on, once again, we summarize the results even more, giving more data um, as far as what the results showed um, in as far as uh, exact numbers. And then in our end, we answer our driving question. So really, um, we're summarizing the data and then applying that to answer our driving question is what I'd look for an answer choice that says. Um, so we look at our options for 29. Uh, we've got option A, summarizing thesis and Andler's finding. That's a very, very great choice. Uh, I'm going to see if there's anything that says summarizing and applying it to the driving question. There probably isn't going to be, so A will likely be my answer, but I'll just quick check. B, describing their hypotheses. No, we're describing their findings. Um, C, illustrating their methods. Nope, that came before 65 to 85. D, explaining their reasoning. No. Okay, we're summarizing their findings. We're applying it to the driving question. So answer there is going to be A for 29. All right, as far as question type for 29, uh, 29 really is a purpose question, okay, primary function of something that indicates to me it's going to be a purpose question. What's the primary function of including this? Well, the purpose of it is to summarize the findings. Okay, 30, in describing squash bees as indifferent, line 68, the author most likely means what? Well, let's go to line 68, come up with our own answer first so we don't have to waste time uh, getting stuck between two. Okay, so indifferent in line 68, this is a little bit of a words and context question, just a little bit, because we have to understand what indifferent really means in line 68. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of this so that we can see it more clearly. Switch to blue so you can see what I'm doing. So we got squash bees were indifferent, and honeybees visited enhanced flowers less often than normal ones. Well, in this case, if squash bees are indifferent and honeybees are visiting enhanced more than or less than the normal ones, 
squash bees are going to be visiting them the same amount. Okay, so they're not going to have a preference for the enhanced flowers versus the normal ones. They're indifferent to either. Okay, they're going to pick them at the same rate. Uh, so enhanced versus normal squash bees are indifferent or they're picking them at the same rate. So I'm looking for an answer choice that says something around those lines. So we got uh, option A, could not distinguish. No, they cannot uh, distinguish. So 30A is going to be wrong. Uh, B, they visited enhanced flowers and normal flowers at an equal rate. Yes, they were indifferent. They visited them at an equal rate. B would be our correct answer there. C, largely preferring normal than enhanced. No, they're indifferent, so they don't prefer one to the other. D, we're as likely to visit beetle infested uh, as beetle free. No, we're talking about enhanced flowers versus normal flowers, not beetle free versus beetle infested. So B would have to be our answer there. And I'm going to switch back to my black pen. We can go and move over to 31. According to the passage, Thies and Adler's research offers an answer to which of the following questions. Or I think I forgot to do my, uh, did I forget? Okay, over here. Uh, 30, I forgot to say the question type, so I'm just going to quick say that. Um, this one right here, pretty much a words and context question. Ability to understand what indifferent means in this context of the scenario. Um, obviously, it's not the typical words and context question with most nearly means, um, but it is pretty much testing your ability to understand what indifferent means in this scenario. So that's what I would call it, basically. 31, according to the passage, Thies and Adler's research offers an answer to which of the following questions. All right, this is a big picture question right here. Okay, how do I know that? Because we're talking about the passage as a whole. All right, so their research is offering an answer to which of the following questions. Well, that's really what we're talking about when I talked about that driving question. So I talked about how we answered why there's an upper limit on the intensity of that aroma that those Texas gourd plants are producing, right? Why won't they just release more? Well, they won't release more because then those beetles come and then they actually get less pollinators because there's more beetles uh, that are deterring those pollinators. Okay, so that was our driving question, right? That's the question we want to answer. What is this research answering? Well, it's answering why uh, earlier on in their evolution did these gourd plants not um, emit more and why aren't they emitting more now? Why is there an upper limit on that? So that's really what we're talking about there. As far as why the other answer choices are wrong, A says how can Texas gourd plants increase the number of visits they receive from pollinators? The research doesn't answer how they can increase the number of visits they receive. What they answer is why there's an upper limit, okay? Because we actually don't ever get an answer as to how they can increase the number they receive from pollinators because we see increasing the floral scent does not work, okay? So we know that can't be an answer. And then C, why does hand pollination, why does hand pollination rescue the fruit weight of beetle infested Texas gourd plants? Um, we don't touch on really the fruit weight. We just talk about it briefly in a summary of our findings, um, but that's really not the big picture, okay? So this is too narrow, okay? This is a big picture question. This would be focusing too narrow on really, it was only like two sentences we talked about fruit weight. So that's really way too narrow. D, why do Texas gourd plants stop producing fragrance attractive pollinators when beetles are present? Uh, we never say that they stop producing fragrance attractive pollinators when the beetles are present. Also, once again, this would be too narrow, okay? So once again, that would also be too narrow. I also don't think it's true according to the passage, but even if it was, that's still too narrow. It's not touching on our big picture. All right, next, which choice provides the best evidence for the previous question? All right, so our answer was why there's an upper limit. Um, I'd probably be looking for um, where I talk about my driving question if they have that. Um, so I'm going to take a look if we have that as an option. Uh, my driving question, I see that that's right here, 85 to 86. Okay, so if I can find an answer choice that touches on that, because that's the answer to the driving question, that would be the perfect answer choice in my opinion. So I'm going to see if I have that. Okay, I saw that was lines 85 to 86. I see I do have that. So 32, D would have to be my correct answer there, right? We're really answering that, dri that driving question. And if we're going to answer the driving question, uh, we want to be able to support it by saying what that driving question is, which in this case is B. So that right there, that's a perfect matchup between uh, 31 being B and 32 being D. I mean, that's just a beautiful, beautiful question in my opinion. So with that, that takes us, uh, oh, I got to answer question type for 32. Obviously, that's an evidence question. Okay. So as always, if that was helpful, uh, there'll be a donation link in the description when it's up and running. Uh, any private SAT tutoring I'm doing will be linked in the description. Any private college admissions consulting I'm doing will be linked in the description. As always, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a great day.